Good evening, everyone, or uh, good day, depending on when you're watching this. Uh, my name is James, and this is the Living for Crits OS Rebellion weekly show. All right, first off, I want to apologize a little bit because, again, my lighting has changed. If you've watched the last two, you'll notice every week the lighting seems to change, and that's not my fault. That's Google Hangouts because that's how we run all this stuff, and Google Hangouts has decided every week it's either not going to run correctly or it's going to mess with me. So tonight we have a different lighting rig, which means I'm kind of like two-faced, like you have the light side and the dark. So uh, this is not some designed effect. Sorry. So if you, this, is your, this is your first time watching. First off, I have the chat up, and I can see the chat. So if you can shout stuff at me uh, like Kevin just did, uh, I can uh, maybe respond. Uh, and maybe you guys have any questions. Feel free to throw my way. So this is part vlog, part review, part rant on my journey from starting off with uh, getting reintroduced into old school games uh, on my way to Dungeon Crawl Classics, my current obsession, the game that I play the most. And if I'm not playing it, I'm thinking about playing it. But there's a bit of road to go to get there. Tonight is a long episode, so I'm not sure if you'll all hang out with me the whole time or not, but if you do, great, because tonight I'll be discussing a couple of games and some, some a, a reviewish evening. On one hand, I'll be discussing the D&D Rules Cyclopedia and the, you know, my, uh, my basic rules, you know, this stuff here. I discussed a bit the first night, but I haven't really reviewed it. Tonight comes my mini review. But making this the most controversial episode, probably of all of them, I'll be discussing D&D 4th Edition, which is not an old school game. If I were to say that, man, the hate emails and comments I get would be terrible. Uh, you might be asking, why are you holding up dungeon tiles? Because as much as I'm reviewing the game, and as much as I'm going to tell you all that I really enjoyed playing it, this is the only thing from D&D 4th Edition that I still own. Is I have two boxes of dungeon tiles, and a bunch of other dungeon tiles. I don't know if they came out of these boxes or I got them from some other set. Uh, my friend Randy, who was in my long-term 4th uh, edition campaign, he bought them off me after I got rid of them. Because once I was done with 4th edition, I was done with 4th edition. And judging by what I see at half-price books, about every month or so, someone else decides they're done with 4th edition also. Because you'll see the flood. You'll see, like, you know, complete... Arcane, complete psionics, whatever they're called, I can't remember, or arcane powers, or it's been so long since I've read those books. But you'll see all of them at half price books, which they do get rid of. People do buy them. Uh, again, non judgment, no judgment here. If you like playing fourth edition still, enjoy playing. But as I've said, I'm about done with that game. The closest I get anymore is I play Castle Ravenloft, the board game, which feels like fourth edition feels. So, anyway, so. Tonight we'll be talking about uh, sort of my progression, uh, and I've been following these episodes sort of in a timeline. And when we last left off, I had played Hackmaster, and I thought Hackmaster was going to be my game, my fantasy game. And it wasn't, so I went and played 3rd edition for a while longer, and eventually fell down the rabbit hole of 4th edition. And I played 4th edition for like three and a half years, and it was... My longest campaign, I think to date, it's like my longest or second longest D&D campaign was the 4th edition campaign. We had 100 adventures, 100 sessions, 30 plus level, 30, 30 levels. I say plus because they had some other characters at one point in time they played. And I ran this game called uh, Ravenscape, and it was a Planescape Ravenloft hybrid. My brother Tom, I had asked him uh, what he wanted to play campaign-wise before he started. We were playing on, on uh, a program called Map Tool and Skype. So we had Skype running for audio. We had map tool running for for our our map, you know, and he wanted to run Planescape. He wanted to play Planescape, and I wanted to play Ravenloft. And we're like, let's just fuse them. So that's what we did. And we, I threw everything in the kitchen sink in that game. They fought a terrasse. They fought that giant colossal red dragon miniature. You know, the one that's this big. That like you have it's on Amazon for like eight hundred bucks right now. That was to scale. We fought that off of a spell jamming ship. Uh, you know, the Lady of Pain was eventually a PC in the game. A player came in with Lady of Pain, my friend Frank. And we played for a, a long time, had a really good time with the game. And we wrapped up in 2012. I was like, let's, let's, let's try something different. And that summer, I started 
buying a bunch of second edition and basic D and D stuff. I was like kind of recollecting. I had kind of had enough of fourth edition for the reason a lot of I'm going to get into in a second. Uh, and I, I, was, I tried to switch the campaigns to second edition uh, AD and D uh, Dragonlance. And it just didn't work. Uh, some of the players wanted to stay in the newer school games, and some wanted to stay in the old games. And uh, it was like half and half down the, down the way of the split, who wanted to go where. And we eventually broke up. And uh, not to get weepy or anything like that, because I'm not going like, to cry or anything. But uh, I actually hadn't gone through a breakup in a long time. Like, I've been with my wife now, it'll be 20 years, you know, been dating uh, in August. And 2012, I mean, not having experienced a breakup in a long time. That was the closest to a breakup I experienced in a very long time. I was really bummed out when we broke up as a group. So, uh, but it was a, it was one of those things. I know a lot of folks say I like the old style gaming, and those are my games. And some folks want the miniatures and like you know Pathfinder and games like that. And we our group experienced that. We had folks that really liked playing the new school, and some folks that really wanted to go back to the old school. And really now it's like with G plus and. Uh, Social media, it's so easy to find other gamers that play the games you like. It's just like, oh, we're breaking up. Oh, it's okay. We'll find some more players. But I still felt in 2012 like it was really hard to find players for a game. So anyway, on to the review portion of this. Uh, for those of us that, that, that played 4th edition for a long time, I, it's funny. I always forget to validate why I liked playing 4th edition D&D. &D. Uh, whenever I say that I enjoyed it, I feel like, are they going to find? Are they going to say something about it? I know my my like my my number one most hated blog post. I think I put up, and why I got the most you know comments on that were negative, and comments especially on Reddit that were negative was when I talked about fourth edition D and D. And I don't want to go down that rabbit hole of how people you like, you don't like it. A lot of folks didn't like it. I find it interesting that in the the cover of my favorite role playing games, you know, Dungeon Crawl Classics, inside a couple pages there is a piece of art. I think it's a uh, I think it's uh, Peter Mullen. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Peter Mullen, where it's a guy on a pyre burning something on an altar to a giant DCC logo. It's one of my favorite pieces of art in the book. And uh, Joe Goodman, during the fourth printing of the DCC Kickstarter, uh, fourth printing of the DCC core book Kickstarter, uh, he had said that was on the pyre was the fourth edition books. So for a game I liked a lot, uh, even... Even uh, uh, Joe wanted to burn it, and for rightly so. I know for, for a lot of third-party publishers, like 4E was nothing like 3E and 3.5. So, But for me at the time, it was a great game. I was in grad school. I was getting my MBA at the time. And I liked a game where I could just kind of throw a bunch of monsters out and just fight monsters and, and play around with our friends while we did it. I, I still think that if D&D &D 4E was released as just what was in the D&D &D Essentials line, so in that smaller book format, and uh, with the, uh, as, as called D and D tactics, I think it would have gone over better. I think if people didn't think it was replacing third edition, but it was just something different. It would have had a better reception. Uh, let's see, BNF DC says the DCC pun jar series was the best four E experiences I ever had, and uh, that's cool. I mean, I I think I think if if I've never seen any of the fourth edition stuff that that Dungeon Crawl Classics did, but I kind of want to jump into it. Uh, because, you know, just to see it. I, I would like to see what their take was on it. I love the DCC adventures so much, and I'm sure if I would like any of them, I would have done theirs or enjoyed theirs. I've only played Keep on the Shadow of Fell. It was the only adventure I ever ran. I think that was by Bruce Cordell. And I had a very good time running it. It felt a lot like Little Keep, like, uh, like little keep on the Border. Yeah, like Little Keep on the Borderlands from from uh, Hackmaster, or the original Keep on the Borderlands is what it felt like to me, that whole experience. And I enjoyed it, but I ran everything else just, you know, uh, we had just some crazy stuff. And we had a campaign based on law and order in the city of Sigil. Uh, the, the players had a, they owned a bar and brothel uh, the, the, full of demons that they, the players owned in our game. So that was kind of interesting. It was a very awkward game. Uh, hey, John is on. Hey, John, how you doing? So anyway, so uh, that's my take on, on what people would think. 
I don't know, my, my thoughts on how I always have to protect myself when I talk about it. So there were some things I liked about the game, though. Uh, like with the, there was a character generator. And when it worked, when it was like downloaded to your computer, I had a great time playing with that. I enjoyed the character generator. Then they made it web native, and I didn't enjoy it so much. The online version was slow as heck. And by that point, there was so much system bloat that it was like there was so much, like so much, so many character classes and races that kept them hard to, to play with. I will say that I think I experienced my first thing close to a uh, purple sorcerer style character generator when I'd assigned dice to all of the, the classes and races. Like there was like 47 classes or races at one time and 28 classes. Whatever it was, I came with a D47 and a D28 or whatever. And I, for a couple games, you had players roll what they get to be, and it was completely random. And we did, uh, you know, uh, 46 drop the lowest stats. Those characters were a mess, but it was fun. I liked the quick encounters when they were quick which often they were, I feel like the encounters were, were pretty quick in the first few levels compared to third edition, but later on they took forever. Uh, it took really long after a while. Actually, until player characters lost their daily powers and encounter powers, the battles can be fun. But I remember fighting a dragon for four hours one night, and we were like, at one point, let's just cut it short. And I think one of the players was like, we're going to do this just to see how long it takes, just to say we did it. And at the end, it, we didn't feel like we earned anything out of it. Even the Tarask battle, by the end, they knew they were going to win. Uh, they were high enough in level to win, but... Uh, I'm talking about the good things here. This is the good part of the reviews. Maybe I should say something. I'm not have, I don't have any good things to say. Uh, I like the way they broke down the roles, you know, leader, controller, defender, and striker. I think that's great for, again, the more of the tactic style game. I think it helped. I think the, the classes that were assigned were a good balance. I like that healing wasn't relegated just to the cleric, that there was the bard could heal and the warlord could heal in their own ways. Uh, it was always a little interesting that the bard had that one power. Uh, they could heal, but they also was, their healing was through like inspirational words, or they had the thing where I think it was like vicious mockery, where they just smack talk you to death. You know, it was a basic attack, a day like a at will power. They could just you know smack talk somebody, and that was it. Person took damage. And then from the, from the the DM's perspective, I gotta say that fourth edition was nice when I ran monsters because each monster had a stat block that was this big. You know real quick. This is what he does with every round. This is when his stuff recharges. Bam. I hated running monsters at higher level in third edition D&D. I couldn't stand it. I think Pathfinder, when I read through that, was the same problem. And the, the thing was, you had like, this monster has like nine feats. I gotta go back and read all the feats and see what they do. And I was never that good at keeping up on the rules. So, you know, hey. Uh, yeah, Sue so just said, healing with words like books. Yes, you know, I think yeah, the warlord could hear with words as well, but I could totally see her being a librarian class. It was a librarian that just heals you through inspirational words. You know, grabs, opens up some Chaucer and reads some some old English to you, and there you go. You know, get some healing that way. What I didn't like about the game, and I'll keep this brief because a lot of folks don't like things about the game. Uh, so that character generator, I said when it went to the web, it stunk. It was slow. Oh, and you can't make a fourth edition D and D character easily without a character generator. I, I don't think you can. Um, I tried not too long after I got rid of the generator, and I was in hell. Uh, it took a, lot, a long time. Going through powers sucked. Uh, it's nice to print those power cards out. Just, I don't know. It wasn't my thing. Combat later on did take too long. Uh, party balance was too balanced. Uh, you knew who was going to win at the beginning of the encounters pretty much, and uh, it was hard to kill a character in that game. Not that killing characters should be everything. Well, it, it is fun, I gotta say, from the GM's perspective occasionally. And um, I kind of was done with all of the rules, and the game was so full of rules. Uh, what you could do in combat, how does a jinx shot look when you're not in combat base, when you are in combat. I don't know. For playing as long as I did and liking as long as I much, I, I like it, liking it for as long as long as I did and playing as much as I did. It's maybe a surprise or not a surprise that fourth edition D and D drove me away from Dungeon Dragon style gaming for like a year, uh, a good year. I played very little. Uh, I was I was kind of done. Uh, I kind of was like you know. I need to try something else. And I went into Savage Worlds and played a lot of Savage Worlds for about a year after that, maybe a couple of years after that. My Savage Worlds intersected with some other games I tried playing. So that's that's my fourth edition take.
But around the same time, actually during the same time I was playing 4th edition with Grown Ups, uh, you know, my basic D&D books, these are what I started my kids on. And that's how I sort of got back into playing these games in earnest because I had dabbled with them prior to this. Uh, but I hadn't played them, you know, in any serious nature, except just to read them and ask friends, you want to try this out? I'll read through it. Nah, it's supposed to play third edition or fourth edition. With my kids, when I was starting to carry old enough to play role-playing games, this is what we really dug into. So, and I can go for hours in this stuff. Like, I brought for the show tonight, I have my rule encyclopedia. This is the Aaron Alston. Uh, he, he was the one that compiled this and threw the rules together for the D&D rules. I think it was like 1990, 89 or 90 this came out. My brother was the first in our house actually to own it. I had these, the, the, the red and blue books. And he got this when I got second edition D&D, AD&D. Uh, but I ended up getting my own later. I also brought with me for tonight uh, some of my other swag I had with it. Like I had the creature catalog. I had a nifty uh, Dungeon Master screen. Um, got a bunch of the adventures. I actually have this like one third of the adventures I have. I have a whole bunch more upstairs. What happened was, I think that summer of 2000 and... No, it was maybe 2010, 2009. I don't know. It was not, around 2009. I saw on eBay a sale, so I had a whole stack of this stuff. Uh, you know, but the only thing I would say I've had the entire time, even back from like the early 90s, is this. This is the one book. This is the Creature Crucible Night Howlers. This is the original. This is my brother's. I'm sorry, Tom. Um, I took his. I ended up using it. He got it for Christmas one year, and he had the basic D&D. &D. My dad, uh, for Christmas, would get him the basic D&D &D stuff, and they get me the advanced Dungeons & Dragons stuff. So I guess because one of us was three and a half years older than the other, they felt one of us is advanced, one of us isn't. Uh, but this is the original that I had. I went and got the PDF bit not too long ago just because I, I love this book so much. Actually, I think the Creature Crucibles, uh, I could spend a whole lot of time just discussing these. These were so cool. Uh, if you don't know what these are, if you've ever seen them, if you've ever played with them, they are kind of like the Savage War, uh, Savage Species uh, for the 3.5 D&D. We can play monsters. I also have Top Ballista, like Top Gun. You play Sky Gnomes in Biplanes. I have Tall Tales of the Wee Folk, where you can play as like pixies and dryads and everything. Uh, actually, the city of Le Mans from uh, from Night Howlers. I've it's like a French city. I think it's in the principalities of Glantry for the known world for Mistara. I've used that city in so many other campaigns, just because I think it's a fun city to play in. I used it. It actually is in last year's Gen Con Accursed game. I based it. I put Le Mans in the world of Morden, and that was the city I based the campaign around. So, but today, for today's show, uh, I'm going to focus on my take on the D&D Rules Cyclopedia. This will be what I'm doing my little mini review on next. Uh, let's see, Jonathan is saying, combats that last a week. That's not far off in 4th edition. And this, like two minutes, your combat's over. So before I go into any kind of stories about, like, about playing this stuff, just you know, my review of this book. I, I, say, I said it before, I'll say it again. If I was stranded on a desert, desert island, this is one of those books that I could live with. I could have this book and be, be totally thrilled. It has everything. Um, actually, of all the books I own for, for the, the fantasy role-playing, uh, the older stuff, this reminds me most of how I don't know, the, like Dungeon Crawl Classics is now. It's one book. It's racist class. Everything's in there. Uh, monsters. Your magic items are in here. Uh, tips on how to run a game. Some stuff for a campaign setting. Uh, ideas for adventures. It's got everything in one book. So you know, D and D uh, Second Edition, AD and D Second Edition had multiple books: the, the Dungeon Master Guide and the Player's Handbook and a Monster Manual or Monster's Handbook. Just one here. So that's kind of nice. And it's pretty much everything combined from the uh, the basic set, the expert set, basic expert challenger master immortal. Am I close? Yeah, I think it's everything from that. So someone can yell at me if I'm not correct in that. I'm pretty close on there. So the Beckme, B-E-C-M-I, that's everything in here. And uh, some other things I found in here that I don't think are in the original game. Uh, there's a mystic class. Love the mystic class. It's a it's a monk that you can play with that uh, the game had. So that was a fun class to play. Whenever a player brought a mystic in, uh, when I played when I was younger, uh, I think they used to die pretty quickly. But 
they just weren't playing them right. I don't think that, I think that's what it was. Uh, there's mass combat rules in this game. I like that because you know when you're when you're for, for the kids here in the house, nothing like telling them you have a whole army to play with. Get get to it. Um, you know they have strongholds and dominions. That was kind of neat. I messed around with that recently with uh, my DCC campaign. Uh, oh, companion. All right, BNF DC says it was companion. I thought it was challenger. I don't know why. I thought it was challenger. Why did I think it was Challenger? Oh, it, just, it said Challenger at the top of this for some reason. I don't know. I just thought Challenger. Companion. Okay. So there you go. I, I, don't, I think I actually own them somewhere in my house. I, I own the, the black books and the, the other color books somewhere. I just don't know where they're at right now. Um, oh, another thing I, I really liked about the, the, the rules encyclopedia is the stuff that was in here for weapon mastery and skills. The... The skill, the proficiencies in second edition uh, AD and D never sort of they were never that interesting to me. Okay, you're proficient in a two hand sword. Well, great. You're proficient in hunting. Great. Um, I liked how in in this game, uh, if depending on what your skill you're trained in, you had the specialization points you would get as a fighter, and you could be more or less proficient in a sword. Maybe your sword does. Uh, you have. You focus all your time on one weapon. That's cool because the more you're focused on one weapon, the better you are with that weapon. It does more damage. It has special attacks. It actually was a nice way of having your 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 two hand sword fighter in basic D and D different from your your hand your hand axe and shield fighter because depending on what you what you put in skill points into your fighter. Each fighter would look very different. You know, fighters specialized in using a net. They could throw the net better on opponents and whatnot. So I don't know if anyone would ever want to do that. Like, I don't know how to make a fighter just design net throwing, but you could. And then the skill system. Uh, I like the skill system. It, it actually, it seemed to me with all the intelligence skills, alchemy, magical engineering, mimicry, it kind of offset one of the things I didn't like about this game, about even basic D&D &D altogether, is that magic users had a pretty pretty crappy you know, spell advancement. My first magic user died uh, trying, to, trying to steal a silver dagger. Uh, I blogged about this a couple of years ago. I'm, I'm still, I still feel it. I still feel him dying. He, he, it was just, this was way back in like 1991, 1992. Trying to sell magic dagger, I had one spell. I was fleeing the 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 guy at the store, and I cast ventriloquism to throw the guards off, and it didn't work. That was a tough DM. Uh, but that's all he had was one spell. And if he had magic missile, he'd gonna toss one magic missile at someone. And I know in a lot of those games, a lot of the, the OSR games now, that's that's how it was, that's how Vancey and Magic work. I get that. Uh, that's I, I don't mind the fact you cast a spell, you forget it. I just wish magic users had more spells. It's one of the first things I liked about third edition D&D &D was I got more spells. And sometimes based on my intelligence, I could get even more spells. With the skill system in this in this game in particular, in, in, in the rules uh, encyclopedia, I thought they gave the wizard or the magic user enough cool skills they could take that made them at least more of a sage character. So maybe they're not casting lots of spells at first level or second level or third level, but they know a lot of knowledge they can maybe use. And if the GM is letting the players role play properly, that's cool. So anyway, I, I like those rules in here. Um, in hindsight, uh, I wish I played this more when I was younger. I was so into the advanced title that I only played it a few times after kind of graduating to 80 and second edition and I wouldn't play it more earnest until I had kids. So that would take a while. Oh, in the back also, I will say, and my brother, I think, uh, and I pointed this out one years ago, but there are game conversion rules in here for AD&D second edition to basic D&D and, and vice versa. So if you are a player of uh, second edition D&D now and you want to try the rules out, you can convert your characters over pretty quickly. Uh, what I didn't like, there's not much here. I'm actually going to stretch a little bit. So I said magic user spells. That always drove me crazy. One spell at first level sucks. Um, descending AC. My math is, my, my head does not math that way anymore. 2000, the, the, the day that third edition came along and, you know, positive base attacks, ditching Thaco, ascending armor class. I know there's some folks that really like the old way. I just can't do it anymore. My brain just, just resets. 
it resets to positive and I have a hard time going backwards. So I can't spit those results out, but that might be because of play. If I played more, you know, first edition AD and D, second edition AD and D, and basic D and D, or I think Labyrinth Lord might go in that direction too. I know that Adventures in the East Mark does. If I played more like that, maybe I'd have an easier time with it. But I just don't anymore, and I didn't at the time. So yeah, uh, I never understood the level limits. Level limits always tossed me a bit. Like I I'm sure there's a reason for this, but you know, you got you know a, a thief that can go to 36 level. Cool. You have a fighter that can go to 36 level. That's also cool. You have a halfling that can go to not not 36 level. I'm going to have a hard time finding this here. Where is it? Your halfling goes to 8th level, and after that, gets uh, their, their, their saving throws are like really great, and they can get experience points after that, but it just changes their attack rank, and the, uh, later on, you have the ability to attack three times per round. Why did that stop? Why not just make it so they go to 36 level also? I don't get that. And I'm sure that had to do something with the way the game was originally written. And again, one of those comments will get me in trouble with the old school folks. But I'm going to say it anyway because that drove me crazy. It drives me crazy. It drove me crazy reading this later after having played 3rd edition and 4th edition as long as I did. Uh, and then the price. So again, I'm reaching here. My nostalgia factor is high. I love this book. But the price is kind of tough. So if you want to play basic rules, encyclopedia D and D, uh, you're going to have to. Well, now at least you can go on and get the PDF for this stuff. I got the PDF for this. I can play off of that. But let's go back to 2010, 2011. It wasn't so easy to do that back then, you know, unless someone had an illegal copy, which I I'm like Mr. Straight Shooter. I don't do that. So uh, I just had I just bought two of these and have one that's like. In case you know of emergency, break glass, and I can pull mine out. That's what I have it for. Um, but you know, the actually the, the 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 fragility of these books. My other one does have a broken spine, and this one here, I, I try to use bookmarks and stuff, but I'm worried about how they're treating, how they're doing with the book here. The fragility is what got me to look at some of the other old school games, and this is the 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 fact that this on on eBay is expensive. This led to me playing basic fantasy RPG, which I'll discuss next week. And that game is like $4 for a core book. Uh, so that's the reason I actually went in that direction in a lot of ways was price. Price of trying to get other players that would use the books. So anyway, so uh, playing the games, I, I played I played this game. I played with the Rules Encyclopedia and the Red Box and Blue Box D&D the most Kind of starting in 2010, I had it was in the middle of my fourth edition campaign, and that's how I got Carrie, my oldest daughter, into role playing. We had played one time before. Technically, her first game is Star Wars Saga Edition. We played for like 30 minutes, and she kind of sat there and rolled dice. My friend Craig and I, and his daughter Baylor, uh, she was she's like me, I don't know, what, four years older than Carrie, I think, three years older than Carrie, something like that. Um, the four of us played together, and there wasn't much interaction in that game. That was about six months earlier. So when Kara was almost six years old, she was still five, we started a mini campaign, uh, Craig, myself, and Craig's daughter, Baylor, and uh, and Carrie, with the basic rules. And actually, if you go on, uh, you find me on Twitter at, at I live for crits, the number four. I have a picture of Carrie's first game with it. It was around Christmas time, just after Christmas time that we were playing. Carrie was a halfling. Uh, I think Baylor was an elf and Craig was a thief. We didn't have a cleric. And uh, I, I actually got rid of death. I thought at the time that if they died, I would just say they were swooned. Kind of like uh, Final Fantasy II or you know, Final Fantasy IV uh, Amer uh, Japanese, but Final Fantasy II American, if you go for the Final Fantasy lingo there. Um, you swooned if you died. You didn't die. I did the same thing. You know, <laughs> funny me for doing that because now my my six year old, I have no problem killing off his DCC character at all. But back then, I was real nervous about what it would do to them emotionally if I killed their character off. Uh, I, I commonly see that as a as a question. Actually, going a little outside of this, what to do with your your kids if their character is going to die, or how to handle character death. Uh, for kids, and I, I will follow. I think it's uh, Judge Joe from Spellburn who just like you know kill him. So I'm cool with that. Just kill the kids' characters off. If you make it not a big deal, they won't think of it as a big deal. Uh, Kevin Spoonie Bard. Yep, exactly. That's where the Spoonie Bard came from, right? So I don't know how that translation happened. You know, it was what Tella said that to to Edward, right? Man, that was a long time ago. Uh, 
so we had, had no cleric in the game, and uh, what we did was there was a magic tree, kind of like the great Deku tree, in the middle of the of the of the the village that gave out magic healing water, and the party just bought that and used that to heal. And the only character that had a hard time in that game really was Craig's thief, I think, who almost died like two or three times. And um, so we played that maybe three, four, maybe five at adventures of a mini campaign for that. And then on and off, as some friends would come over, uh, Jen's cousins, they'd visit, they would play the basic D and D with us. That was sort of our game of choice when we weren't playing fourth edition for all the younger kids. And uh, it was actually the game that I got my wife to come back into role playing with, at least to try. She wouldn't go into a full campaign with until she she discovered new we discovered numenera in 2013 but in 2012 we had a little mini house campaign it was the start of a short lived like like a bedtime story role playing game we'll do these from time to time or we'll set up a game table in my kids bedroom and we'll play on the floor with dice and the dog will lay there and we'll just have some maps out on the floor we'll play like an hour before bedtime and that was one of the first ones we did it actually was the first one we did and it was in 2012 i found the picture it was in july i was going through to try when i was trying to come up with the dates for this this vlog i wanted to be right on target because i take pictures of everything it was 2012 in July, and my wife was Eric the Cleric. Carrie was Lena Goblin Hacker, uh, a fighter. And I don't remember Evie's character name, but it was a pixie out of Tall Tales of the Wee Folk, which meant like she would, she'd fly and was like natively invisible. Pretty powerful character class. But again, this was she was six, five or six years old at the time um, when she was playing that. So that's how we got them into the game. We played through a quest to take out Bargle, the evil magic user. If you remember out of the red box, there was the, you know, Bargle kills the cleric and the solo adventure, and you have to go chase after Bargle in the, in the DM, the, the, the DM's book. So we did that adventure over, you know, I don't know, three, four, five nights, uh, and revisited those characters a few times. So that was our, that was our play. And so it wasn't a lot of games, but some of the most memorable games were with this book. And, like I said, I think I, I kind of feel bad that I haven't played with it as much as I had as I, I, I could have. Uh, I probably spent a couple hundred dollars recollecting a lot of this stuff only to use it more as inspiration for other games. Like I said, I've used the mass combat rules and the uh, the 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 uh, what's it called? The 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 castle building rules in my DCC campaign. And I've gone through and rated some of the equipment lists. For other, for when I was running basic fantasy RPG, but I've never really spent a lot of time on a campaign with this. So that's I'm glad I have it. I'm glad it's in my collection. I've almost left out the chicken. So uh, one of the things I was thinking about when I was going through how to relate, you know, going from fourth edition to zero edition or or basic D and D was the, the the biggest reason why I wanted to go back in that direction, at least to at least to second edition AD and D after fourth edition or to find something else, which I eventually did, was I wanted to get back into more story focused games. For being fourth edition AD or D and D, my game was pretty story focused and sandboxy. And I felt it was kind of a struggle with that rule set to do it. So whatever I played with next, I kind of wanted that same feeling. And I loved how basic D and D, uh, how how you the know, combat's fast. You know, monster hits me, I hit the monster. A couple swings, you're dead. Five minutes, ten minutes, that combat can be over at low level, but it's only like a sturge in a hallway or some goblins. Uh, but you know, in in the other editions, and you know, fourth edition, third edition, Pathfinder, I feel like. You know, sometimes it gets so rule focused. There's just too many rules, and there was one moment in all of my games with basic D and D prior to getting out of fourth edition and getting out of those the newer school D and D games that kind of showed me best how just reminded me of what I was missing or what I felt like I was missing. Because again, some people get this from other games. It's just the way I run games that was that I felt I was a little stifled. And that was the incident with the chicken. So it actually happened in 2010, maybe mid-2010, in one of our games with the kids, with Carrie and Baylor and, and uh, uh, Craig, when and my, my cousin Sean might have been there too. He had a dwarf. Uh, they had to cross a river, and the, the, the players, uh, Carrie and Baylor, kind of started spitballing ideas for crossing this river. They had, it was part of their quest. And there was a farm nearby, so they raided the farm, and they grabbed a chicken. 
And uh, I think it was Baylor who thought that Carrie's character, being a halfling, could was weighed so little that a chicken could easily fly her across the river. So Carrie grabbed the chicken, she put it over her head, she shook it a whole lot, and she jumped. I think she was thinking about like you know, the basic Zelda games she used to play at the time. And I said, that works, that's great, you crossed the river. And I thought, wow, this is there's you no know, skill rolling. Uh, I didn't make them roll anything for that. They just shook the chicken and, and, and jumped. I think I'd allow that in my, my games now. Maybe I'd make there be some more rolling. Uh, but I don't know. I like that. I like that feel. And I, I would think about that feel as I was finishing up fourth edition about, you know, the, the, the feeling almost stifled by some of the rules. And uh, yeah, that, that was my take. Let's see. Uh, BNF says, Bargle broke my heart in 1986. 11 year old me had a huge crush on Alina. Yeah, yeah, I felt I felt bad for Lena. She like she's in the adventure for like what five minutes and she gets shot down. Spoiler alert! By what I think is a magic missile, I think that spell is magic missile. It's a little hovering arrow that flies off. So I imagine that's magic missile. So anyway, uh, so uh, that's that's my take. It's my take on those two games. So uh, I don't have much else to say about them. Uh, you know, I, I'm I'm very glad that I, I own this still. I'm very glad that I have it. I'm very glad that I played Fourth Edition D and D, and I'm pretty glad I'm not going to play it uh, again. Um, that's that's tough. If I was, if someone wanted to GM Fourth Edition D and D, and I was there, I'd have no problem playing it. I'm just not going to run it again. So those of you that thinking, hey, let's get in one of Jim's online D and D games, then nah, I'm not playing that. Um, so uh, next show, next week, uh, I'm going to be discussing, I'm going to start getting into the actual OSR and the term OSR. Uh, so, you know, I, I learned about OSR because I was trying to find, or even the term, I was trying to find alternates for the rule cyclopedia, something else to play. I would find basic fantasy RPG through those alternates. And uh, there was actually, when I found it and kind of started it in 2013, wasn't there a lot of like controversy around the the term? I don't remember. I know it was it was a tough it was tough at the time. Uh, to I was like I said, old school Renaissance and old school rules. I don't know. I remember I came from the the going thinking everything was O D and D that was before uh, A D and D, not realizing that there was versions at that point. Uh, again, hats off to Tim Baker for uh, for guiding me through all that. Uh, now, because even now, getting getting ready to do this this vlog, I'm, I don't remember. I don't know. But I'll go into basic fantasy RPG. I'll go into Adventures in the East Mark and playing those games a little bit. Um, Andy Lyon, he says, 5E has chickens. That that may be, but I can't I can't play 5E. I'm not allowed. It's like my shtick. I can't I can't play it. I'm not allowed. Uh, I think I think if my my folks that read my blog thought I played 5E, I'd be in a lot of trouble. So uh, D, D, DCC, you know what? If I started playing 5E. The, like the five DCC core books in my house would like surround my bed and set my bed on fire. Those books are dangerous. Um, anyway, so I'll go into uh, into how I discovered those games and my thoughts on those games, and uh, and we'll go from there. Oh, Christopher Moore, why not allowed? Oh, this is a long story. Uh, br briefly, there was. Uh, I did play in the so I'm I'm, I'm going to say why not allowed to play fifth edition D and D. So uh, if, if some folks that follow me on Twitter will, will grill me on this a little bit too sometimes. And Andy's Andy's a regular gamer of mine in two of my DCC campaigns. Uh, it's fun. Andy will will rib me on the old school stuff, but he keeps coming back for more. So I don't know, you're, you're 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 crazy, Andy. You keep wanting to come in and uh, get get murdered by me, but you know I knew you were more of a fan of the other games. Andy came on to play with me for Numenera originally, and I suckered him into playing old school stuff. Uh, so when I left D and D in 2012, I got into the uh, the it was the what's it called the beta rules for the new D and D next for a while, and just. I, don't know, I just didn't feel it in those early rules, and I kind of fell into Savage Worlds and kind of liked the pulp feel of that. So, uh, you know, I kind of just left the rest of the the D and D next rules and didn't get back and even looking at D and D again until it was the old school D and D. And by that point, uh, that I think D and D five came out. It was the summer that I had sort of discovered Dungeon Crawl Classics, and at the time, I didn't feel like going down two roads. So I sort of like grabbed DCC, figured it's out. I'm, I'm liking what I'm seeing. I'm going to stay with this and, and read this. And then I had like an ongoing, 
I don't know, sort of like there were some friends that would play fifth edition and it was like a, kind of a, a running gag that I wouldn't touch it and I wouldn't play it and I kind of smack talk it a bit for not having played it, which I, I actually have read the basic rules for fifth edition and think they're really core, really, really good rules. Uh, I like the two dice mechanic for advantage and disadvantage. I think it's really sharp. I think that was they started introducing that into the play test that I was in. I like the character backstory, how they build the characters. Uh, how you have, if you're a fighter, you maybe you have like some kind of I don't know what's called because they don't play it, but like maybe you, you you're a fighter, you start out as a guard, you start as a noble, and your character has some backstory that's not just uh, skills. I do think it's a cool idea. But uh, I don't have the need to play another fantasy game. I feel very comfortable uh, playing uh, Dungeon Crawl Classics. And I'm the kind of person who gets obsessed easily. So I, I worry that sometimes if I play that, I'll, I'll like, I'm going to jump all into that and change things around. I'm so easy with the, the ooh, shiny system to take a term from Ron Blessing, of the, uh, who I used to listen to his, his Savage Worlds podcast, uh, Smiling Jack's Bar and Grill. That's when they come with the ooh, shiny syndrome. I think it came from him. Uh, and Christopher, yeah, Savage Worlds is awesome fun. I've played a lot of, a lot of Savage Worlds and have quite enjoyed it. Just don't play it that much now, but I still seem to jump in a lot of the Kickstarters, though, because there's so many good books with that. So, Sir Lucian says, running two 5e campaigns weekly and a one-shot on Sunday. Been going great so far, but found you and Andrew through learning to run Numenera. Yeah, I, it's another game. I, I have an ongoing Numenera game, but it's kind of derailed a little bit because uh, I was running on Mondays, and Andy was part of that game. I think every game, see, Andy lives near me, and Andy has free time because he's, he's not uh, been, been hit with all these kids that sort of take up all my time. So, uh you know, he, he's in most of my games, almost all my games, and he's a great player. Great player to have at the table. He, he doesn't play the best cleric, but he plays an awesome thief. Um, so, sorry, Andy. If, if he could just roll better on for his char cleric character, he'd do so much better. But, you know, he just rolls so low when he's making characters. I don't know. It's, it must, he doesn't have the skill. So... But anyway, it's a lot of chat tonight. So thank you all for watching again. If you enjoyed this vlog, again, like, comment, and subscribe. I'm, I'm going to try to keep this to uh, there being, you know, seven of these. But if this goes well, I might, you know, try some different chats, go into some other games. I would love to go into more detail on some of these games. Originally, it's going to be seven, like, 15-minute episodes. But I'm, I... I am long-winded and have a hard time doing that. Plus, I really like listening to myself talk. I know some folks don't. I do. So my kids like listening to me talk, too. They'll watch this afterwards. So I do try to keep it PG. That's the only reason why is I might catch Cooper, who's my six-year-old, like watching this later. And i got to be careful what, what I say on here. But I think the chat thing, you guys can say whatever you want. I don't think you can see that stuff. So, all right. Well, have a great evening. Happy gaming. And I hope you all have some great stuff uh, lined up this week behind the game table, behind the game, the DM screen. So take it easy. Have a good night. Thanks.